if a little bit of training is good, then more is better. Mm -hmm. Um, fasting, going down the fasting rabbit hole, like, you know, I did a little bit of fasting. I feel good. So more is going to be better on that end. And Mm -hmm. so it's really just kind of taking a step back and, and realizing that more is usually actually not better when it comes to these things, especially for a woman who already have a ton of stress in their life. Like, so mm-hmm. work stress, stress from family, um, stress for maybe chronically restricting calories for long periods of time, right? <laughs> Metabolic stress. Yeah. Metabolic stress. Yes. Mm-hmm. So all of these things play into it and it's really just thinking about, okay, you know, am I putting my body in the best possible position right now? Because we know that like exercise is a stress and we say yeah, exercise is a good stress, right? It's the, the you stress, right. Versus distress, but it only goes to, to a certain degree, right. You kind of hit this, uh, it's like a U curve, right. Um, an upside down U. like you hit a certain point where it's like optimal. And then it, at, at some point it starts coming back down. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the reshape your health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte. And today we have Rachel Gregory joining us. She's a keto expert for women. She really specializes in helping women become more metabolically flexible. And we're going to talk about what that means today. She's the founder of Metflex life and the host of the Metflex and chill podcast. I can't wait to share this interview with you today. So let's go ahead and dive in. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the reshape your health podcast. We are delighted to have you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's going to be a really fun conversation. We were talking offline a little bit about what we wanted to cover today. So as a brief overview to the audience, we have a lot of good topics. We're going to talk about metabolic flexibility, which is a newer topic to the show. It's kind of a newer topic. Um, in general, at least in the broad nutrition online field, we're going to talk a little bit about keto for women and how to build muscle and lose fat. Cause they kind of take different approaches. And we're also going to talk about how to optimize your nutrition around your workouts to build muscle. And then we're saving a really cool tip for the end. Cause Rachel's going to talk about some underrated fat loss tips. So Rachel, welcome. Can you just give our audience a little bit of an overview of who you are and who you help and how you help them? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Rachel Gregory. Um, I'm a board certified nutritionist and I work mostly with women. I coach a lot of women. I have, um, group coaching and individual coaching. And a lot of my kind of wheelhouse is around women who have, um, experimented and, and, gone into the keto low carb space, have gone through, um, a period of, you know, a ketogenic diet, saw good results, um, and then kind of hit this sticking point or this kind of point where they were just like, okay, I can't really sustain this anymore. It's not working with my lifestyle. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit carb phobic, um, and not really being able to enjoy some of the foods that, you know, I used to enjoy. And so that's where I kind of come in and, um, using keto is, is can be, I think it can be a great tool. Um, but going through it myself, um, I'll get kind of back up a little bit. I went to, um, I went to undergrad in at university of Miami and I got my, uh, undergrad degree in athletic training. And while I was studying there, I thought that I wanted to be an athletic trainer. And then I started to take some nutrition classes and got really, really into nutrition and exercise physiology. So I decided to go ahead and get my master's in nutrition and exercise physiology um, afterwards. And when I was getting my master's, we had to, it was a two-year program at James Madison university, and we had to do a thesis um, and do a study. And a lot of my classmates were doing more survey studies. And I knew that that wasn't really something that would interest me for two years because it was two years of, you know, diving deep into a specific topic. Um, so I talked to my advisor and I told him I wanted to do more of like a human clinical style study. And so I ended up doing the first study, looking at the ketogenic diet in non-elite CrossFit athletes. Um, And so that was a very uh, successful study in the sense of we were looking at how much body fat they could lose over a period of time um, compared to a going on a ketogenic diet compared to a a standard American diet. Um, And so that was back in 20. 
16 is when I graduated from grad school. So that study got published and then that just propelled me into the whole world of keto, low carb. And that's really when it actually started to become a lot more popular um, within nutrition. We know things ebb and flow throughout the years. And so keto kind of was starting to, to peak around that yeah. time. Um, so it kind of, it just lined up well with what I was, you know, researching. And then beyond that, um, I adopted a ketogenic lifestyle for myself, um, went really strict keto for probably two plus years. And I started having, you know, some adverse effects, got very carb phobic, didn't really know where to go. And then, um, kind of figured that out over the years. And it brought me to this concept of metabolic flexibility. And so that's really kind of my wheelhouse now is teaching specifically women, how to incorporate keto strategically as a tool, um, and really dive into just really being able to use your metabolism to its full degree, right. Being able to use fat and ketones for fuel when it's warranted, but then also being able to use carbs and sugar when it's warranted in, in the specific situations and then going back and forth between them effectively. So hopefully I didn't ramble That's a on great intro. There. <laughs> nope. Nope. She already warned me that she's a rambler. And I said, as a geriatric PT, I have to be really good at redirecting. So this will be just fine. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I wanted to back up. I always back up and I want you to describe what living a ketogenic lifestyle looks like for you. Yeah, sure. So it definitely looks different than, uh, what it did a few years. Like, I guess we're in 2021 now. So back in 2016, I was kind of, like I mentioned deep into keto. Um, if I personally adopted it myself because I found really great results and mo more so, um, some body composition changes, but also just the mental clarity and the kind of, uh, ability to get away from like really focusing on food all the time and kind of having that afternoon slump and energy levels were just really great throughout the day. And so that's really like, I was at that point, I was like, oh man, I don't need carbs anymore. Like I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I started, you know, experimenting with fasting and I thought, you know, fasting is this whole other wheelhouse. And I just kind of went down the fasting rabbit hole. Um, and then eventually got to the point where I was just trying different things. And, um, with keto, I, like I mentioned, I started to become a little bit carb phobic and I realized that I needed to, to switch things up and start to, especially with my performance and, um, getting more into exercising and, uh, bodybuilding style training a little bit away from CrossFit. Um, so I started incorporating carbs and I started seeing a, a at first it was hard because my body was just so kind of metabolically, and we can talk about this metabolically yeah. inflexible on, on the other side of the spectrum. Um, so when I initially started introducing carbs, I was getting kind of all of the same issues. Like my blood sugar was drop, uh, spiking too much. I was having energy fluctuations throughout the day. And, but once I started to adapt to that and kind of realize how I could use carbs strategically around my workouts, you know, before bed, um, it really, it really just was a game changer. And so that's kind of how right now, how I, I guess, live my lifestyle is really just trying to optimize both sides and really stay in that balance of being able to tap into, you know, fat and ketones for fuel, being able to fast whenever I really want to, or need to, and not really have those adverse effects from fasting, um, or kind of fear of fasting in, in the sense that a lot of people do, but then also being able to use carbs, you know, around my workouts, like I said, before bed, if I want to kind of wind down some hormonal regulation, things like that. Um, so it's really just that metabolic flexibility and being able to go back and forth is what I strive for. Um, cause I think it's kind of the, you're getting, you're actually getting the best of both worlds. If mm -hmm. you're doing it strategically and implementing specific strategies kind of within that and within your own personal lifestyle to, to help with that. Okay. So I'm always curious, like how many grams of net carbs a day are you averaging? If you're doing a ketogenic lifestyle, using it as a tool, I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious on that. Yeah. So I generally don't, um, I don't really track net carbs with my clients just because I find that it just gets a little bit too confusing in the gray area of things, especially obviously, you know, with clients, we promote whole foods as much as possible, but there are some packaged foods that tend to, you know, every once in a while get in there. And it's like, that's can be very confusing. If we're like, Oh, track net carbs. And then you look at a package of something and it's like, 
30 total carbs and like two net carbs because sugar alcohols and all that jazz. So I tend to like stay away from that just because I found that there's like, I've tried, I've done it in the past, but I found that there's just mm-hmm. too much confusion and too much gray area. Um, but for me, it really depends on kind of what stage I'm at in my, um, in my life, like in my journey. Um, I always, we, I know we talked about periodization. We're going to talk about that a little bit, yeah. but just really like where I'm at. So for example, right now, um, and I'm, I, uh, train a lot. I exercise a lot. I lift a lot, I lift weights. Um, so I go through, I periodize my nutrition based off of my training right now, um, because I am going through different training phases. So right now I'm personally, I'm actually in a metabolic training phase where I'm doing a lot of, um, higher, a little bit higher intensity, uh, work in the gym, um, lower rest period. So I'm more so in that glycolytic state a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. so I'm using carbs to fuel that training. Um, and because I, I have been pretty metabolically flexible for a while, um, for the last few years after I kind of figured it out, um, I'm able to use those carbs strategically. And then also like, for example, I woke up this morning and I've been fasting for, I don't even know about 14 hours now. And I feel great. Um, but I did have like a bolus of carbs yesterday during my workout. So for me, it's really, I I don't really like to say, oh, I'm having this amount of carbs, you know, right now, because it changes, right. It changes depending on where I'm at. Um, and that's really how I work with my clients and, and encourage them to look at their nutrition is really based off of, okay, what's your main goal right now? What do you feel comfortable with? What is sustainable for your lifestyle? Um, where are you at in your, like all the other feedback, um, mechanisms that we have that tell us like how our body's responding. So how's your sleep? How's your stress management? How's your recovery? All of those things play into it. So, now I'm rambling on again, but hopefully that gave you a little insight. <laughs> so you like time. I think that this is interesting from like a muscle building. If we kind of move into, you know, how do we build muscle and how should we time our nutrition around our workouts? You kind of touched on it. If you're doing, you know, more burst activities, fewer rests, that carbs can be beneficial to improve your performance. So let's talk about how do we build muscle? I mean, I think that muscle is obviously more metabolically active than fat tissue or adipose tissue. It it's really more insulin sensitive. So I would talk about insulin resistance a lot. Muscle mass is very helpful for that, but I think that there's a lot of confusion around what it actually takes to build muscle. So can you talk about both the exercise and the nutrition and anything else that really plays into building good muscle tissue? Yeah, absolutely. So with nutrition, I think one thing to mention first is that again, it all comes back to what your primary goal is, right? Because we can have different goals and this is kind of something that, uh, is really important to just think about and also think about where you're coming from too, like you personally. So are you someone who is, you know, more sedentary, maybe you're overweight or struggling with insulin resistance, and you're still looking to build some muscle, but you also primarily probably need to be dropping some body fat, Mm -hmm. um, as your primary goal, then that's kind of one, one thing, right? Like we can still focus on building muscle, um, and periodizing your training appropriately and focusing on progressive overload. And I can go into all of that, but if your primary goal is to lose body fat because you are metabolically unhealthy, then we need to make sure that we are, you know, getting into a calorie deficit that we're able to find something that we can sustain, um, something that works with our lifestyle. Right. Um, on the other side of that, it's where a lot of women come to me who are already kind of on the leaner side. Right. And they, um, don't have much body fat to lose, but they still think they need to lose body fat and maybe they need to, they want to lose a little bit, which is totally fine, but they're kind of in that wheelhouse where they are very active. Maybe they're more like type a personality, which is where I used to be at. Um, and so they're always go, 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 like train six days a week, um, restrict calories as much as possible to try to lose that quote unquote last 10 pounds or five pounds or whatever it may be. Um, so when we're in that camp, it's really more so looking at, okay, what have I been doing? Have I been restricting for a long time? Have I been in a calorie deficit for an extended period of time? And my body's just like, tapped out on its recovery resources, not able to recover. Maybe you are in the gym training and you are, you know, doing everything that you're so supposed to, supposed to be doing with your training, but you're not getting the results. A lot of that can come down to just not being able to recover from the stimulus that you're putting your body under. And that usually tends to be because we're under eating and we're not fueling appropriate, not eating enough protein, especially 
if a woman has come from like more of a keto approach and they've taken that more high fat, very low carb, like lower protein, moderate protein, see a lot mm-hmm. of that in my practice. Um, so the first thing I would do is just make sure that we are bumping protein up to support, you know, what you're trying to do. Right. And especially when it comes to building muscle, you know, protein is super, super important for that. Um, so yeah, with muscle building in general, like, first of all, I would just first figure out where you're coming from, right. In those kind of those spectrum. And like, maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Um, and then really just like what your primary goal is. So if you are on the you know leaner side and your primary goal is to build muscle, um, then you're probably going to want to be consuming enough fuel to support that muscle building, you know, side of things. Um, and then one other thing with that too, and it's something that, um, we have to realize is that muscle weighs something, right. It doesn't just come out of air and whatever. Right. So if you're looking to really, you know, go into a quote unquote muscle building phase and put some lean tissue on your body, first of all, you have to be feeling appropriately, but you have to also be okay with seeing the scale number go up because if the scale number is not going up and obviously like we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is strategic and we're, we're not going from like, you know, just downing tons and tons of calories because we think that that's what what it takes really doesn't take that much extra calories to, to be in a, in a slight surplus. But with that being said, we do want to make sure that we are kind of aware that if the scale isn't going up a little bit and if you're, you're already lean and your main goal is to build muscle, then, you know, we might not be doing what we're trying to do here because muscle weighs something. So, Mm -hmm. um, that's just one thing that a lot of women, especially it's hard for us to grasp. Um, And I, it was hard for me to grasp that when I went through my first building phase. Um, So those are just some things that are kind of common, but here I am rambling on. So feel free to interrupt. No, sure. So how much protein do you typically recommend in a day? And then what about the protein dosage and protein timing during a building phase? Absolutely. So with protein, I try to keep it as simple as possible around like one gram per pound of body weight, especially if it's a woman who is on, you know, more so the leaner side of the spectrum. If you are on the other side of the spectrum where you're, you're closer to like overweight or obese, or you're struggling with that, um, bringing protein down, maybe around like 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Um, that's generally where I go. And then Mm -hmm. for those who are leaner, even bringing protein up even higher can be beneficial. Um, just because we know that there's so many benefits to protein, um, when it comes to just all aspects of life. So not just with muscle building, but, you know, feeling satiated, we know the thermic effect of food is higher with protein. So even going up like sometimes 1.2 grams per pound, if you're, especially if you're a leaner, even up to 1.5 grams, that's probably like the top end of it. Um, and for some people, they feel better when they have higher protein, they feel more satisfied. I do. (laughs) Um, same. Yeah. So, and and that goes not just for muscle building, but also into a fat loss phase as well. Um, so generally, like I would say between 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight. Um, I know some people go through, go, um, for pounds of lean body mass, but I've just found that that can be very confusing for people because not everybody knows their lean body mass and Mm -hmm. we can test it, but there's, you know, variances there. So just keeping it simple between 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight is a good range to be in for most people. Um, and then in terms of timing, so this also depends on kind of, again, where you're coming from. Like, are you very experienced with, uh, your training and your nutrition? Like, are you, have you been tracking a lot? Like, are you very dialed in with all the other other aspects of what's going on in your life. Um, because if you're not dialed in with those things, then really the, the timing of things, they matter, but not as much, right? Cause if okay. you're not sleeping if you're not managing your stress, like the other things are kind of just like drops in the bucket. So, um, but if you do have those things dialed in, then I would say with protein, it, it is important in, in my opinion, to get enough feedings throughout the day. If your goal is to primarily build muscle, you want to make sure you're putting yourself in that anabolic state. So, um, and this can be a little bit different too, because we can go into the whole fasting thing. Um, and it's really, again, it's just so independent of the person and kind of what their primary goal is and and also where they're coming from too. Mm -hmm. So, so from a building phase, do you recommend at least like two feedings a day, two meals a day, or how do you have any general recommendations on that? Cause I just recently just decided to attempt a building phase for the first time. Cause I, you know, I don't need to build a ton of muscle. And, um, 
my husband actually said, please do not ever tell me again that you're trying to bulk up. (laughs) And I said, oh, why not? Um, and I got really tired actually. So my typical, I don't know, I think caloric intake was around 2000 to 2200 with probably 150 grams of protein per day on average. Okay. Um, and so I tried to bump it up just, you know, maybe a couple hundred calories. Um, I don't, not too much more protein than that, maybe 160 grams. And I just felt really tired and I didn't know if there was something nutritionally, or if you'd experienced that with your clients where they eat more and they have a little bit more fatigue, or if maybe that was just a, a, a weird couple of weeks. Did you, so are you saying that you felt tired from increasing your protein intake or just increasing like calories in general calories? I think it was calories mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that is, that is definitely normal. If you are, especially if you're going into a surplus and you have basically more fuel coming in, your body's just not used to that. It will take some adaptation mm-hmm. to occur. Right. It's like you said, the first few weeks, um, and your body's probably just like, Oh, you're now you're feeding me all this like new or extra fuel. Like, what am I going to do with it? So it probably is just kind of that adaptation side of it. Um, and then with protein specifically, where are you, or are you trying to like, how many feedings would you say of protein did you have per day? I was doing three. So my normal, my regular schedule is fasting for 14 to 16 hours a day, usually two meals and a high protein snack or three meals condensed. And so when I was trying to do that, I was doing maybe 12 to 14 hours of fasting with three solid meals, and then maybe a high protein snack. So mm-hmm. I didn't know if that was an, enough feedings with at least, I was like to say at least 25 grams of protein per meal. I didn't know if you recommended any more than that. Yeah. So that is generally good. That's what I typically recommend, especially so in a building phase, if your primary goal again is to build muscle, um, we definitely want to make sure that you are in that anabolic state, right? So anabolic, just meaning that, that building state catabol- building, right. catabolism is breaking down. Right. And so fasting in itself is a catabolic state. And so with fasting, we just want to, especially if the goal is to build as much muscle as possible, you want to be careful there to make sure that we are, you know, not putting yourself in a catabolic state more than you are an anabolic state. Again, this is, it's different for different people and, and, and all does come back to what works for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but with protein feedings between three to five, generally to maximize that muscle protein synthesis throughout the day and get enough of those spikes, um, because with muscle protein synthesis, we know, like you said you recommend at least 25 grams. That's absolutely what I would recommend, like probably around 30 plus, mm-hmm. um, protein feedings, like 30 grams of protein per whatever meals you have. So if it's like three full meals and then a high protein snack, um, that's going to be advantageous because you will be, uh, you need enough, uh, amino acids in general, but you also need enough leucine, which is one of the essential amino acids to spike that muscle protein synthesis. Um, and so if you don't have enough protein in one feeding, you're, you're not going to be able to get past that leucine threshold really. Um, so you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. Um, in that sense. So what, like you said, around three to five protein beans a day, you know, around 25 plus grams of protein, depending on where you're at with your other calories and macros. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also just making sure that they're coming from a a quality source. Um, we know that what to have, you know, a complete protein source, there needs to be, you know, an, either an animal source or combination of certain um, plant mm-hmm. sources to make sure we get that full amino acid profile. Cause that's going to be very important to make sure you, um, kind of turn on that light switch for muscle protein synthesis. Um, so yeah. Talk about the leucine. Cause that's something that I've learned about, but I haven't covered on the show. So will you tell mm-hmm. us what leucine is? What's the threshold Um, and then you kind of touched on a little bit that we need a complete protein profile or source. So will you dig into that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So I'm sure everybody's heard of like BCAAs or branched chain amino acids, right? Um, or if you haven't totally fine. So there's three, (laughs) yeah, there's three branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And these are important for, uh, stimulating that muscle protein synthesis response. Um, but a lot of people kind of get confused because they think, oh, I can just make sure I get these BCAs or drink like external BCAs and I'll be spiking that muscle protein synthesis. Um, that only happens to some degree. Yes, you could be spiking muscle protein synthesis, but if you don't have all of the other amino acids available, Mm. then it's kind of like putting a key in the engine, but not having any gas, right? So if you have that key, which is really, you can look at, think about the key as leucine kind of 
turning on that switch, but if you don't have gas in the car, you're not going to go anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need those other amino acids available to continue the, the process of, um, building, right. Getting in you into that anabolic state. And so leucine is just one of those amino acids, but it's not, it's important, but it's not just like, you can't just take a scoop of leucine and, you know, build muscle. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need everything. Right. Um, and you need it in a complete sense. So that's where the complete protein comes in. Um, we know that animal proteins are, have the full spectrum of the amino acid profile that we want, um, versus plants have, um, some of them, but not all of them. You can combine certain foods from plant sources. So like, you know, beans and rice, for example, if you, you know, want to get a complete source there, the issue with that though, is that, um, plant proteins are not as bioavailable to our bodies as animal proteins. Um, I'm a very big advocate of animal proteins, um, just because they, yeah, yeah, because they are, your body is, you know, you're very bioavailable so you can absorb them. You can use, you know, all of the amino acids from them to build muscle, which is the goal and repair and all of that, which, um, we know is super important, not just like the muscle building side of things, but also the recovery and repair side of things that protein is important for. Um, uh, because if you're, if you're, you know, constantly stimulating your muscles and in, in the gym, right. And, and putting that stress on your muscles. I always say when you go to the gym and you lift weights, you're not building muscle during that time. You're actually breaking your muscles down. The only time that you're building muscle is after that, when you're recovering. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have adequate recovery resources available, right. From your protein, from your calories, from your sleep, from your, you know, reducing stress, all of that, then you're not going to build muscle. Um, yeah, you may be, maybe build a little bit, but it's not going to be optimal. You can force it. So what about protein timing? Cause some of my, um, members, they like to use intermittent fasting for the fat burning. Mm -hmm. They also want to build protein. They want to work out in the morning to use up, um, you know, their carbohydrate reserves in their body, if you will, to push further into ketosis. And they're like, how do I time my workout with my meal to optimize both fat burning and muscle building? So can you mm -hmm. provide some clarity there? Or give, give your recommendation. Absolutely. So I would say if you're someone who trains in the morning, um, and you feel great training fasted, that's totally fine. Um, and I, I would say like, continue to do that. If that works for your lifestyle. Cause especially people who wake up at, you know, four 30 or five, they're not going to want to consume a full meal before their training and like try to digest that. So if you feel good fasted training, then go for it. If your goal is to build muscle and, and give, put yourself in the best environment possible, there are some strategies around that. Um, so you could potentially, um, have like a, you know, a protein shake that you sip on, you know, before you train or throughout. So maybe like a, a whey or egg white, some, some type of fast digesting protein powder. So you're kind of sipping on that, you know, before you start your workout and throughout it, um, that's going to help with just getting that kind of one protein feeding in, right. To put yourself mm -hmm. in that anabolic state. Um, if you're not good, like if you want to continue training fasted, um, I would say that, uh, just having, making sure that you are having enough protein post-workout. Um, so it really just comes down to thinking about, we, we've probably heard of the anabolic window, right. That is like, you know, we've, we've been told, at least I have been told in the past that you have to like down a protein shake right after your workout, because then you, if you don't, you're going to lose all your muscle. It doesn't really work like that. Tell us um, how it works. I don't think we've covered the anabolic window here. So what yeah. is that? How does it all work? Yeah. So the anabolic window is basically, it's really kind of like a bodybuilding bro term where, um, <laughs> they say like, after your workout, you're supposed to consume like a bolus of protein like within, you know, 20 minutes of leaving the gym or like right when you leave the gym, or you're going to lose all your muscle that you just, you know, work so hard for. Um, and that's not, it's first of all, the window that they talk about is more so like an extended, like garage door. I could, I would say you could call it because it's not just this small period of time. Um, it really does depend on how long you've gone without a protein or a feeding. So if you, like I said, if you had a, a, mm. a shake before your workout, right. Or throughout it, um, after your workout, you can wait a little bit longer, like maybe a few hours before you have your full meal versus if you were to train fasted and you haven't yeah. eaten for like 12 hours, right. You're, you're fasting throughout the night. 
um, then that window does become a little bit more important, right? Because you're just, you're looking at the, the full timing of the last time you ate, basically, and the last time you had a protein feeding. Um, so if you are going into your training fasted, then it's probably more beneficial to get a meal a little bit closer after your training um, versus if you were to have a meal before your training, then it's not as important. Um, you could probably wait a little bit longer. Um, and then it also goes back to that recovery side of things. And it kind of, we can even get into the benefits of carbs post workout and all of that. Um, so it really just, yeah. yeah. Do you say like half an hour to an hour, or you said a little bit, like if you're going into your workout fasted, what's your mm -hmm. recommendation for when should you have that, that, um, complete pro the animal based or complete protein profile of amino amino acids, at least 30 grams. When should we have that after our meal so that we don't miss that anabolic anabolic window or like the building window when we can really, mm -hmm. um, make muscle. What's your recommendation? Yeah. So I would say, again, it's really like, there's no, like, oh my gosh, if you don't have a protein feeding within, you know, an hour, like your window's gone. Like it doesn't yeah. typically work like that, but if we're trying to optimize, optimize um, I would yeah. say, yeah, I would say that if you went into your training completely fasted, like you've been fasting, you know, you went to bed and you woke up trained with just some water or whatever, then I would say probably getting, um, either a protein feeding in like a, a, a 30 grams of protein throughout, like in a shake or something like that within maybe an hour, hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. and then maybe having like a full meal a few hours later, cause some people don't like to eat right after they train. Yeah. Um, or if you do want to just maybe wait like an hour and then have a full meal with protein, you know, your protein feeding carbs, whatever it may be. Um, that's totally fine too. Um, so it's just thinking about, okay, like literally just thinking practically about it. Like how long have I been fasting for? And have I been more in this catabolic state? Let's get into that anabolic state because it's been a little while versus if you ate before, then maybe you can go three hours without having that, that feeding. But it yeah. also does come down to like, you know, what are your other feedings throughout the day? And I think I would start there first, like planning your feedings out, um, like when you typically eat and then kind of structuring it in that way. Okay. And then, so just out of curiosity, how would that differ from a fat loss phase? You know, how you talk about the periodization of your nutrition. Sometimes you want to build muscle maybe, or bias your, um, program towards that. Sometimes you want to bias it towards fat loss. So how does that differ? or if, yeah. if it does. Yeah, absolutely. So for some people, it might not differ at all. Um, and then for others, when I, when we're talking about fat loss as the main goal, really mm -hmm. the primary part of that is looking at overall adherence. So what can you adhere mm -hmm. to throughout your day? Right? So if you're someone who trains really early in the morning and your primary goal right now is, is fat loss, then maybe pushing your meal off a little bit a little bit later because it helps with your ability to stick to your calorie intake for that day. Maybe that's beneficial for you because it helps with adherence, mm -hmm. but we also have to think about, you know, if you are training very hard, right. And you, you know, you are still trying to maintain as much muscle as possible because when we're going into a fat loss phase, the goal is to maintain as much muscle and maybe build a little bit of muscle and still lose body fat. Um, and that's important protein feedings to come into that, you know, recovering optimally will play into that as well. Um, so it's really just kind of thinking about, okay, what can I, first of all, adherence, what can I adhere to for my day? How do I plan out my day so that, you know, if I am someone who, you know, does better eating later on in the day and maybe fasting till like, say you w w worked out at 7.00 AM and you know that you want to fast till 12, right. And you know, that works for you, right. You have a feeding window from like 12 to seven or whatever it may be. Um, and that's what works for you. Then that stick to that. Right. And kind of, you can also play around with, okay, maybe I'll have a, a hundred calorie protein shake right after my workout. And maybe that actually sustains me a little bit past that 12 mark. And I can even push that off a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So it really is just kind of playing around with what works for you and trying to find that kind of sweet spot. Um, but when it comes to fat loss, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that you are getting enough protein in throughout your day, but really focusing on, okay, what can I adhere to for my personal lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And it takes a while. I mean, if you're going to do this, right, it really does take a while. And I think that that is hard for a lot of women because mm -hmm. once they really change their lifestyle to a higher protein, higher fat lifestyle, like you said, they're going to be building muscle probably, which weighs more than fat. And so it's a slower process, but it's 
more likely to stay off. So I feel like that's kind of something that we have to address a lot is just kind of the mindset piece. And I also think that part of that is incorporating more of the lifestyle. Like you talked about stress, you talked about sleep. And I think that sometimes we just, we think that if we try harder and we get up earlier and work out more that we should see results. And sometimes maybe they need to sleep more (laughs) instead of push harder and harder and harder. So can you talk about the importance of optimal stress management and sleep when it comes to metabolic flexibility? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the kind of the areas that I missed for a really long time. Personally, um, I was, like I said, type a, you know, more is better. You know, even if I got four hours of sleep, I'm going to wake up and, you know, get my workout in, yeah. um, you know, training like five or six days a week thinking that that was best. Right. Cause if, if a little bit of training is good, then more is better. Mm-hmm. Um, fasting going down the fasting rabbit hole. Like, you know, I did a little bit of fasting. I feel good. So more is going to be better on that end. And mm-hmm. so it's really just kind of taking a step back and, and realizing that more is usually actually not better when it comes to these things, especially for women who already have a ton of stress in their life. Like, so mm-hmm. work stress, stress from family, um, stress for maybe chronically restricting calories for long periods of time, right? Metabolic stress. Yeah. Metabolic stress. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So all of these things play into it and it's really just thinking about, okay, you know, am I putting my body in the best possible position right now? Because we know that like exercise is a stress and we say yeah, exercise is a good stress, right? It's the, the you stress, right. Versus distress, but it only goes to, to a certain degree, right. You kind of hit this, uh, it's like a U curve, right. Um, an upside down U. like you hit a certain point where it's like optimal. And then it, at, at some point it starts coming back down. Um, and that's where we talk, have you ever mm-hmm. talked about the Goldilocks zone? No, this? talk about, no, huh? Sure that. Yeah. So it's basically just, we have like distress, which is kind of stress. That's a little bit harmful or, or, or quote unquote bad. And then we have you stress, which is good stress, which is, you know, exercise, um, some fasting, maybe some, um, like you hear people talk about, um, like hormetic stress. So putting yourself into like a cold shower or something like that. Oh kind of, yeah. <laughs> haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah. But I don't yes, do that. often. <laughs> I'm a wimp. Um, so and we have these kind of two, two sides of it and this, the middle kind of part of it is the optimal zone. So like the Goldilocks zone where you have a little bit of stress, but not too much stress. And that's really mm-hmm. where the kind of the, the optimization happens. And that also goes back to metabolic flexibility, right? With metabolic flexibility in the beginning, we talked about this spectrum, right? And so kind of being on the side, or maybe I didn't talk about this yet, but being on the side where you are a sugar burner, maybe you've been burning car, like you've been, you know, just high carb your entire life. Um, and you are just running off of carbs versus someone else who might, maybe they've gone strict keto for a long time and they're just bodies used to running off of fat. Those are two, the two extreme ends of the spectrum for some people, they can live in that those ends and be fine, but the majority of people can't. And the majority of people don't need to, unless, especially like for keto, for example, if you're trying to treat some type of like neurological disease or epilepsy or something like that, where you have like a, a patho, like you are in a disease state and being in a ketogenic state is what's going to help you with that, then that's a whole different side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of people tend to get like that mixed up, right. They get, they tend to get the, the uh, disease state part of keto mixed up with like the optimal health part of implementing a a keto or low carb lifestyle. So anyway, those are kind of the two spectrums, but with that sense, metabolic flexibility is being able to live in the, in the middle somewhere, right. And be able to use both fuels. And with the, the Goldilocks zone, that's the same thing. Kind of you're in this optimal state where you have a little bit of stress and it's good. But if you kind of dip into the other state, if you dip into that other part of it, that's too much stress. And we know that our body doesn't perceive stress differently when it comes from exercise, when it comes from, you know, getting cut off in traffic or whatever it may be, it all goes to what we call our allostatic load, which is just our overall stress bucket. And if that bucket becomes full and too full and it starts to overflow, that's where we start to see issues. Um, so rambling on again and (laughs) what issues are though? Like, so how does an overflowing stress bucket impair muscle growth and impair fat loss? 
Yeah, absolutely. So really it, it does come back to kind of just looking at, okay, what is your overall stress and how is that affecting what the processes in your body? Like with, we know that with kind of chronic stress, it can lead to chronic inflammation. Um, with that, like we can lead to insulin resistance and issues with blood sugar regulation, kind of going down that whole pathway. Um, but with muscle building specifically, like I said, like if you're not recovering, if you are not putting your body in a, in a kind of a rest and digest mode, we know that we have our nervous system needs to recover, right? So we mm -hmm. have um, different parts of our nervous system. We have the autonomic nervous system, which contains the, or not contains, but it has the parasympathetic and the sympathetic sympathetic is kind of that go, 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 like yeah. run from the bear parasympathetic is rest and digest. So with exercise and with stress, like you're in that sympathetic mode, right? But if you don't get into that parasympathetic mode at times, like you're not going to be recovering. You're not going to be sending that signal to your body that says, Hey, I'm kind of chilling out. Like I can recover now. My cortisol is going to drop a little bit. I can, you know, focus on repairing and rebuilding because if you're not like, if you're putting so much stress on your body, even if you're, you know, going hard in the gym, like if you can't recover from that, then you're not going to be building muscle because your body's not going to prioritize that, right? It's going to prioritize taking care of all the other things that are going on, right? So that's the biggest thing that I would say when it comes to just recovery and, and muscle building specifically and fat loss too, right? Like if your body is just like overworked and you're like, you can, yeah, maybe you can lose some body fat, but are you putting yourself in the best possible situation to be able to sustain the body fat that you've lost, right. With all the other things that are going on in your life. So do you think sometimes over exercise can be a hindrance to weight loss? I do. I do yeah. for sure. Um, I think there's a ton of different kind of routes you can go down with that. Um, I think one of the main things is that it can definitely mess with like hormones. You can have chronically elevated cortisol because you're just chronically in that sympathetic state. Um, and so that can hinder other issues, right. And cause even cause it can even mask fat loss. And so then people think, oh, you know, you know, they see the scale stay the, the same for a few weeks and it could just be that they are really stressed out and that they're holding on to a ton of water weight. Um, and because their cortisol is high, but then, and then they're like, by the end of those two weeks, they're like, oh, this doesn't work. So I'm just gonna, you know, go off and have whatever I want. Right. So it's, it's a mental side of yeah. things too. And so, yeah. How long, so if someone's been doing keto or OMAD and they're on a really ketogenic diet or lifestyle and they're carb phobic, how do you reintroduce carbs without a ton of weight gain and without a ton of, you know, mental symptoms of fear? Mm -hmm. How do you yeah, get over absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a few different routes you can take. Um, I think the biggest one is first, just the education side of it and educating people on, okay, if you've been keto for a long time, your body is not used to carbohydrates, right? You've kind of put that, uh, carbohydrate metabolism machinery on hold, uh, because your body is just hasn't needed it. Right. So it's adapted to not, uh, producing the enzymes that it needs to, to really optimize the metabolism of carbs and use them in your muscles and things like that. I um, mean, it's the opposite side too, right? If you've never run on fat or ketones, your body is not primed for that because it's never, well, actually, Fun fact is everybody is born with, uh, in a ketogenic state, right? Because as a baby, you're, you're having your mom's breast milk or whatever, or even formula is high fat, right? So you are really in that, in that state, but then most people transition off of that, right. For a mm -hmm. while. Um, so anyway, just, those are kind of some things to think about. Um, but I just lost the, <laughs> the question in my head. No, so transitioning from OMAD transitioning. or super low carb how do you yes. do it without all the fear and without all the weight? Yeah. yeah. So like I said, first part is education. Then also realizing that carbs, right? So carbs have, um, they come with water, right? So when you consume carbs, you are probably, especially if you haven't consumed in a while, you're probably going to see the scale go up the next day, for example, because carbs hold on to water. So I think it's like three to four grams per three, to four grams of water per gram of carb. Um, so that in itself is just like, okay, if, if you know that, like going into it, you're like, okay, I'm consuming carbs. So I know my body's going to hold on to some more water. That's normal. That's a normal part of it. Um, so that's just one piece of it when people are kind of scared of like, oh, I woke up and gained four pounds or whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah. So it's just water, right? You didn't gain four pounds of fat overnight. That'd be very, very hard. Um, very, pretty much impossible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when we're introducing carbs first is like the psychological side of it and just 
being educated on that. So, you know, what to expect. Um, the second thing I would say, like in terms of when you're going to introduce the carbs, I typically like to start, um, if you are someone who's working out pre or po post workout and use it. Cause we know that around your workout is when you're going to utilize those carbs, um, to the best degree, right? Because our muscles are especially post-workout a very insulin sensitive. So it kind of soak up those carbs. Mm -hmm. However, if you are chronically keto for a while, it's going to take some time for your body to start to produce those enzymes again to the, the, to the best degree, to be able to utilize those carbohydrates. So some of it does just take time, right? So taking it like maybe a, a week or two weeks to kind of bring that turn that machinery back on. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's, and I would say that's probably another side of the education piece of it. Um, but around your workouts would be where I would start. Um, cause that's probably going to be most advantageous pre-workout, giving you a little boost of energy post-workout, um, helping to, we know that cortisol and insulin have are opposing. So if you can spike insulin with carbs, um, that can actually bring cortisol down. And that's something mm -hmm. that we would want post-workout to get you into that rest and digest and recovery state. Um, that's just one piece of it. Okay. So that's where I would start there. If you're someone who doesn't work out, um, and you, you know, are just looking to reincorporate carbs sometimes, um, at nighttime so that you are kind of throughout the day, you're, you're still more in that low carb state. And then at night, when you're trying to wind down, it can be advantageous to, um, have a bolus of carbs because that can help with producing some, some of those, uh, neurotransmitters, some of those hormones, serotonin kind of calm you down. Um, those are probably the two places that I would start. So pre and post-workout, um, cool. and, or nighttime. Okay. And so I think the nighttime carbs is interesting because in the past we've talked about how your, your body is less tolerant to carbs. So you'll have a higher blood sugar response in the evening to carbs versus midday. And so I think that's just a trial and error, not error, but just to try it out with your body and what, what feels best and what feels right for whatever your goals are. Um, so I think that's really good. I do want to touch a little bit more on the types of carbs. Cause I think that there's some, some confusion here. So what types of carbs do you recommend reintroducing first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I would say also like when we're talking about carbs, just when we're starting to reintroduce them, I probably, and I, I definitely would recommend having them with some, some protein or fats That's to kind good. of slow. Yes. Yeah. To slow that response. Cause we don't want to just go from no carbs to just like eating a ton of carbs without any other fats or protein, because yeah. that's just going to cause blood sugar to go crazy. Um, so you definitely want to consume them. We kind of say like no naked carbs. Um, that just means <laughs> I've like never not, heard. I like that. Yeah. Like just not having carbs on their own. It's not that it's like quote unquote bad, but it's probably more advantageous to help with that blood sugar response. Mm -hmm. Um, and to kind of keep it from going too high. And then also we know that when it goes too high, that's when it can crash and come too low. So it's really just kind of managing that balance. Um, but with types of carbs, I mean, I always advocate, especially if you're just reintroducing carbs, whole foods, right? Mm -hmm. So focusing on, I always say, you know, has it grown from the earth at some point, or did it have a face at some point that should really be, <laughs> that should really be like the majority of your diet in general. Yeah. Right. So if it had a face at some point, it was an animal, or it was maybe like eggs that came from an animal or even dairy that came from an animal. Um, and then grew from the earth at some point would be, you know, your vegetables, your fruits, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, that should really just make up the majority. If you look at your overall diet, like if the majority of it is that, then you're probably doing something pretty good. Right. Yeah. Um, so with carbs, like, you know, just introducing, um, obviously veggies are going to already probably be in there. So the non-starchy veggies, so bringing some starchier veggies in. So things like maybe some winter squash to start off with, um, potato, like sweet potatoes, potatoes, uh, fruit, those are kind of the general starting mm -hmm. points. Um, and then like, if you are to a point where you do want to start to, you know, get back into enjoying some treats once in a while, like having maybe some more processed carbs. And that's what you want to do for your lifestyle. And you want to go, you know, to an event and have, I don't know, a piece of cake or something. It's like, that's okay. Um, uh -huh. that's something that I used to fear a lot. It's like, if I have a piece of cake, I'm going to blow up. <laughs> um, but yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Or that I wouldn't be able to stop. I mean, like mm -hmm. as a former, I mean, just, I love sweets in general, you know, it's like, okay, I'd have one and then I'd snowball for the mm -hmm. next day or two days or week. And so the protein yeah. has helped with that. I have, I have two more questions. So you talked about digestive enzymes or 
enzymes that help us process carbs and process fats and how, when we're metabolically inflexible, our body is not ramped up with the proper enzymes to help us digest those types of nutrients. Do you recommend anything to help boost those enzymes either on the, you know, carbohydrate dig digestion or the fat digestion to kind mm -hmm. of speed up the process of getting metabolically flexible? Yeah. So, I mean, you definitely can take, um, some digestive enzymes to help with that. Um, I don't generally recommend, like, I, I really like to take a practical approach to it. So like, if you are really trying to become metabolically flexible, like, and this is like, you're turning your lifestyle into this, right? Like you want to tr like basically, you know, tell your body to do that without an external, an external source of something. Right. Um, so with digestive enzymes, I think they can be beneficial for certain people, especially if you do, you know, struggle with gas, bloating, things like that. And your body's just not, you know, producing them to that effect. Um, so it is something you can try, like you can try to take some digestive enzymes, especially if you're reintroducing carbs. Um, some people say taking like berberine to help with that blood sugar response. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, I just feel like if you are generally healthy, like, and if you don't have any issues where maybe your body, like for some reason it doesn't produce enzymes at all or certain enzymes at all. And, and that's the case. And that's kind of a different story, but for a generally healthy person, who's just looking to maybe reintroduce some carbs, um, then I think it just taking it slow and making sure you're pairing those carbs with fats and proteins yeah. and you're doing it in a way that, you know, makes sense. And, and maybe working with someone to help you do that work with a coach or whatever it may be. Um, I think that's probably just more of a practical approach for most mm -hmm. people. Okay. And then I wanted to talk about the underrated fat loss tips. So I like, I like that. So share with us as this kind of wraps up your top underrated fat loss tips for women specifically for women specifically. Sure. So I would say the first one, and this is something that, you know, when I have a woman coming to me, it's always, usually the first thing that I tend to increase is, is protein. Mm -hmm. Um, because no matter what type of diet you're coming from, I found that a lot of women, especially are just under eating protein, right. Especially coming from keto, um, or even, you know, on a standard American diet, like we're just really chronically under eating protein. So mm -hmm. that can be super beneficial because I've seen that we can even keep calories, you know, not even go into a calorie deficit and just kind of swap out your macronutrients to increase your protein. And you can see fat loss from that because we know that, like I said, protein has the highest thermic effect of food, which just means that protein, it's about 20 to 30% to digest protein versus fats is about, I think it's like one to 2% and carbs are about three to 5%. And all that means is that your body literally takes energy to digest, right? And so it takes more energy to digest protein and then it does carbs and fat. So if we can increase protein, then you're putting yourself in that advantageous position to not only eat more, but potentially <laughs> see some body composition changes from the protein that you're taking, that you're taking in, you know, with muscle building, uh, lean body mass retention, like there's so many benefits to protein. Um, there's actually studies that have are recently come out that have actually compared, um, people on the same amount of calories that have increased protein to even like two grams per pound of body weight. And they actually saw, um, the same degree or even more body fat loss from that increase in protein, because protein has, does so many different things in our body that it's not, you know, just going to kind of go to waste, right. Our body yeah. is, is so many processes. So protein's number one, I won't ramble on about all the others. Um, protein would probably be number one. Um, I think accountability is one of the biggest pieces that's missing. Um, for me, that was, I kind of went through my own journey as well in terms of body composition changes. I like come kind, kind of coming out of that keto strict keto phase. I hired my own coach and I just sat, saw so many benefits from having somebody else hold me accountable for the things that I said I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and so I have had my own coach for the last three plus years. I probably will always have my own coach. Um, and it's just because that accountability factor is so, so important, um, from, from what yeah. I personally think. Um, so accountability is another thing. And it's really in the sense of like, you can have an accountability partner, right? Like some people say, oh, I'm going to have an accountability partner, but there's one thing to having, you know, someone there or even a family member to having someone who's kind of outside of that. Or, you know, we talk about, 
Um, and I don't want to get into like the financial side of things, but usually when you like pay for something, you're much more likely to follow through with it. And there's been studies that show that I know for sure that if I'm paying for something, like I'm going to put my whole effort into it. Um, Mm -hmm. so that can be a huge piece of it. So accountability, um, in general, just like movement, like walking around and tracking your steps is just so underrated when it comes to fat loss in general, right? Like we think that we need to go get on the treadmill or the elliptical or whatever it may be. But honestly, with my clients, like we, that's the last thing that we tackle is the car, the formal cardio aspect of it. If we're looking at fat loss, we're getting your nutrition on point. We're eating protein or lifting weights to tell your body to hold on to that muscle because it needs to get that signal. Um, we're walking, we're tracking steps and just getting you cause walking does so many different things, not just quote unquote, burning extra energy, but also getting you into that parasympathetic mode, that rest, yeah. <clears throat> digest recovery. Um, and then hopefully if you're walking outside, you're getting sunlight, right? So all of those things kind of stack on top of each other. So walking is super underrated. Um, just tracking your steps and getting your general meet up your non-exercise activity. Um, so just paying more attention to that. Right. So if you are, if you have a step goal with all my clients, we have step goals. I have a step goal myself. Um, that just helps you to be more aware. Right. So instead of like, for example, right now I'm standing up. Um, I, I try to Good stand for you. <laughs> <I'm jealous. laughs> no, I try to, and it's, it's, it's crazy. Like how much of a difference it makes and just like once you do it a few times, it's like, oh, okay, that's fine. Like I can make that a habit. Right. And so mm-hmm. you don't realize, but you actually are like what I'm doing with my hands. <laughs> I know. I noticed you're a big hand talker. And I like yeah. that. I look like a little bird with my sleeves if I'm oh, talking no. with my hands too much. <laughs> so yeah, those are just some things that you don't necessarily think about. So, um, protein, walking, accountability, sleeping, sleep is so underrated. We kind of already talked about that. Mm-hmm. Um, like making sure that you are just, you know, getting good quality sleep and making sure that that's part of stuff that you're working on. Um, if you, even if you have a very hectic lifestyle, um, if you find that you are, you know, resistant to weight loss and you're just having a lot of trouble losing weight or losing body fat and you're not sleeping like that needs to be, that needs to be in check because we know if we don't sleep, it messes with our hunger hormones. It messes with all yep. the other things, Makes cravings skyrocket. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, I would say that is probably, oh, and then last one is just tracking. So yeah. like tracking what you're, and, and not necessarily Helpful. just tracking calories and, and protein and macros, but tracking your biofeedback. So with all of my clients, mm-hmm. we track sleep, we track stress, we track recovery, we track training performance, um, hunger throughout the day, cravings, and we do it in a, in an Excel doc. And this just gives us that data so that we can look back and see, oh, okay. Like this, this, I was eating this at this, you know, during this time and I was having good sleep or I was, you know, working out and I was having bad sleep or whatever, like putting these things together, right. If you're working out too much, you're not recovering and that's affecting your sleep, then it's just going to be like a domino effect. So Mm -hmm. just tracking these metrics, um, is, can be super, super beneficial because, for example, like sleep, like I always say this, but I don't remember how many hours of sleep I got like two days ago (laughs) at all. But if I look at my tracker, I can see, okay, I got that much sleep. I felt like this, this day. And the next day I felt like that. And so it all kind of plays into each other. So Mm -hmm. that is what, you know, what it's the saying, like what gets measured gets managed. Right. So, yeah, I think that's good. I'm going to have a video coming out. I think next year, um, on the last 10 pounds. So I had a one year, I mean, I have a one-year-old daughter, a three-year-old son, and it took me not very long to just kind of get to a baseline. I was like, I'm happy. I'll maintain here. And then I was finally like, okay, I'm kind of ready to, to start again. And so it's kind of fun to get back in the loss phase. And I don't know if I'll do all 10 pounds, but, um, I just think it's kind of fun. And one of the first things I said was I have a strict bedtime now. So Mm. like in bed, no later than 10. And that was kind of the, one of the very first ground rules that I set for myself. Cause my husband and I tend to get a little bit TV heavy in the evening, (laughs) which is fine, but I'm glad that you brought that up. So thank you so much for your time today. Where can our listeners and viewers learn more about you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my uh, website is metflexlife.com. I have all of my, my stuff on there programs. Um, I have a podcast myself called Metflex and chill. Uh, It's on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms. Um, and then I'm most active on social media on Instagram, um, at rachelgregory.cns. So those are the main places. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'll be sure to link up all of those resources in the description on the YouTube video and then on the blog post. So we really appreciate your expertise and your time today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. Bye. Bye.